Everybody, you're watching the Mike Nelson Show. I want to thank everybody who's already liked and subscribed to the channel. We have almost 500 subscribers around the world. So thank you again for your support. Today, I got a very special guest. I got the legendary singer from Crocus, Mark Storace. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing fine, Mike. How are you doing in LA? I'm doing good. It's actually very warm today. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, also the FIFA World Cup is going on. So uh, I don't know if did you did you watch. Are you watching the FIFA World Cup, Mark? Yeah, I, I think I better not talk about it today after last night's uh, soreness. You know. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a, it was a tough loss, of course, for Switzerland. What do you think is going to win the World Cup? It was Cup, a Mark? bad, bad, bad day for Switzerland. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> oh, shame. The shame. What do you think is going to win the World Cup? Uh, Brazil. <laughs> I mean, they play like hell. You know, they dance. They don't. They don't run around. They dance, and uh, they're so confident. And I like yeah. their style. I think I, I think Brazil's going to win too. So let's 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 kick off the interview. So where did it all start off for you, Mark? Where did, where is where does where did you start your musical journey? When did you know I want to be a musician? When did you start singing, Mark? You know, going all the way back to when you were a kid growing up. Holy moly. Well, you know, I grew up in a musical family. My father used to sing in this choir uh, at the local church, which, which was about 50 yards away from, from the house. And my mom played piano, classical piano. My eldest sister played classical piano. Uh, everybody in the family sings, you know, so when something came up on radio, uh, when we had lunch or dinner uh, and a song that everyone knew, you know, we all joined in and and everyone tried to find his harmony, you know, so we could harm it. So it was kind of this happy-go-lucky uh, feeling, uh, harmonizing with music while we grew up through all the problems that that entails, you know, growing up teenage times and so on but anyway so I went through my puberty and everything as usual still at school but I I was listening to the radio and uh, I became a fan of of the of the livelier music you know whilst my parents listen to opera sometimes it's this dark voices you know you know that scare you in the night you know uh, so uh, my, the first band that really turned me on and I, I got addicted to was the it was like more pop music you know which which is the Beatles you know and uh, before that it was uh, Chuck Berry and, and Elvis was the first one that really kind of uh, yeah, I mean, he even had nice ballads and stuff like that, you know. Um, but uh, Little Richard, uh, his his song Lucille, it was the first song where I I learned to to manipulate. I learned to use the falset, you know, you know the Lucille, you know, you know that, <laughs> and on the end, you know. And I was still a kid then, you know, about 13. And uh, so at that time, I wanted to buy a bass, a bass guitar and visited this band, a local band, you know, just amateur uh, band. And uh, he used to play on the bass guitar, boogie, you know. And and one day the singer, the, the typical cliche, you know, their singer was sick and they had a gig. Well, you know. Um, I grew up in a musical family. My, my dad sang and my mom played piano. So did my eldest sister. And we all sang together during lunch if uh, something good came on the radio, you know. So it was a musically harmonizing family I grew up in. And five doors or even less than that away from, the, from our house, there was this uh, bar called the Wild Swan Bar. And they had a jukebox in there, a nice Wurlitzer. So then this was always uh, stacked with uh, the latest hits, you know, starting with Chuck Berry going on to Elvis and later on the Beatles, and the Stones, all the pop bands that came. Um, you know, and by that time I was already singing in a band because 
I had been invited to to fill in for a singer who who got sick by a local band, uh, and 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 I I happened to be there because I wanted to pl uh, play bass bass guitar, you know, basically. And but I had this whole collection of lyrics in my head and songs that I that I liked. I used to collect lyrics and share them with uh, school friends and so on. You know, it was a hobby. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, from then on, I was only 14. I did my first gig and that's when I got hooked, you know. It's like a virus. <laughs> now, you grew up in, Mal in, in Malta. How did that shape you as a musician? Well, Malta, is, you know, in those days, back in the 60s, even earlier after the war, you know, they, they started to enjoy the, the freedom and, and the, yeah, automization and all that. And in came this Wurlitzer, you know, in, in the bar next door, right opposite the, the local church, you know. So there was this balance between heaven and hell just on the crossroads next to the house, you know. And uh, I was an altar boy. I was a, a boy scout. I became a venturer. I became a singer in a band. And I, I had girlfriends when I was still wearing short pants, you know. <laughs> all, all, the, the, all the stuff we go through in puberty. And uh, so, you know, because Malta was um, kind of, you know, allied forces, just won the war and, <clears throat> and all that. And we were quite actually well uh, up to date with everything that was happening in the USA and London, you know, England and the rest of Europe. So we had all the latest hits on the radio and stuff. And so I was uh, really, I soon started to, to have the urge to leave the little island to get out on the continent where I could become a professional singer, you know, and by hook or by crook, <laughs> through many ups and downs, here I am, you know, at my age, still singing. Thank God, you know, that's nothing which we take for granted, you know, singers. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> but I try to keep fit and um, I love doing it. And I guess, you know, it's it's my top passion. It's what I like doing best in life, you know, so, yeah. Now, you moved to London in, in 1970. How was it like, you know, moving to a, you know, a new country, England, um, you know, the language? Uh, how, how was it like, you know, be, you were pretty young, too. Uh, how, how, how was that move for you, moving to England? Yeah, it was around uh, between 19 and 20. And, uh, uh, yeah, the language, it, it, that was the easiest thing because we grew up in Malta and people still in Malta because... Malta was a part of the British Commonwealth um, <clears throat> for uh, we, we, we spoke English, you know, as well as Maltese, which uh, well, you wouldn't understand that language anyway. It's, a, it's kind of a mix up between the Mediterranean languages and uh, <clears throat> it's not so important, but I love speaking it. I speak it, I write it and uh, have fun with it just like everyone else. But the main language that got me going as a singer as well was English, naturally. And thank God, you know, I, I went to London and made some friends and met this girl who had connections. She was Swiss and she had lost her passport. And I helped her, showed her where the Swiss em embassy was on Leicester Square. And I was working and I had a day job in Piccadilly Circus at that time. And uh, anyway, so I ended up in Switzerland, which is a beautiful country. And, and I thought, wow, you know, um, now I'm singing in a, in, a, in a band, in a progressive uh, hard rock band in Switzerland. And um, I don't want to leave. <laughs> and I actually made a big step from what I was doing in Malta with my bands in Malta, because, you know, I, I sang in two different cover bands there um, because in Switzerland we started writing our own songs you know so I was using uh, my English and all the 
uh, all my fantasy, letting that go in there and all the melodies that I had inside me and, uh, you know, regular rehearsals, regular gigs. And, you know, then we started touring Europe and we went out with Nazareth. We went out with Status Quo. We toured uh, the whole of Great Britain with uh, Ginger Baker from The Cream with his band Baker Gurvitz Army. And um, we ended up, you know, the, the, the last tour we did um, was with none other than Queen, you know, Freddie Mercury and Queen. So this was like, wow, you know, we used to watch every sound check, you know, you know inc incredible. The, the, the dynamics and, and the stuff, we, it was like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, because they they really had it, you know, they really had it. And uh, this uh, stage persona of uh, Freddie Mercury was just something else. He was larger than life, you know. And uh, that was good, you know, it was good for us. It did us good. Now, you recorded three albums with T. Any favorite moments, you know, playing with the progressive rock were you into progressive rock at that time oh yeah yeah i i fell in love with uh, progressive rock when i was still in london because uh, what i left behind me from uh, the cover bands in malta was a collection of led zeppelin deep purple the who and all the nicest uh, classic hard rock bands you know that was our repertoire but when i went to london <clears throat> I'd done this over and over. So when I heard yes, I was walking through Carnaby Street, went into this clothes shop, and you know, they had these big speakers blasting out, you know, songs from Fragile. And it's still my favorite album, you know. And from then on, I started uh, keeping an ear open for progressive music. And when I went to Switzerland, uh, uh, there was this guy I shared a flat with, and he turned me on to Genesis, and uh, there was this band from Holland called Van der Graaf Generator, you know, with Peter Hamill singing. And uh, it was all this amazing stuff, you know. And of course, Pink Floyd were always, uh, were always in there, you know, in, in, in my heart. You know, it was like, if I wanted to relax and just chill, I always, still today, put on Pink Floyd, you know. <laughs> Now, the band uh, T, of course, you mentioned toured with Nazareth. A any thoughts? You know, we recently lost Dan McCafferty and Manny Charlton, two, you know, legends. What do you think Nazareth's impact, you know, was on the whole hard rock and maybe even heavy metal genre that came later? Yeah, I, I think they they uh, did quite quite a hell of a good for, for hard rock because, you know, when, when that single came out, Love Hurts, I'm not sure if it was even written by them, but but still, that performance, you know, and Dan's voice was so incredible, so much energy in there, and the way he used to pressurize everything to, you know, love, you know, love. From from here, it needs so much power from from the lungs and the rest of the body, and. Uh, it was amazing stuff. And, and he was such a quiet, nice, quiet guy, you know. And, uh, well, the rest of the band was, obviously, they taught us how to behave backstage, I guess. <laughs> and on the tour bus, you know. And the, and the first thing they introduced us to after meeting the whole band and crew was uh, a big, big icebox full of, all, all brands of whiskey and, 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 and great alcoholic drinks that we couldn't afford at that time, you know. <laughs> so it was, uh, we became great friends immediately. <laughs> and, uh, drinking buddies, huh? Drinking buddies and, and also just, you know, buddies. Every time we met and a couple of times, if I was just watching... Uh, if I was just attending a Nazareth concert and uh, got backstage, then I got invited on to to sing something with them, you know, 
whether it was uh, my generation by the who or, or whatever. <laughs> now, T's last album came out in 1976, but you didn't join Crocus until 1979. How were those years for you? Did, did you think about quitting the music business during that time? Did I think about what? Sorry. Did you think about not you know, giving up on the music business? What were you doing from 76 to 79? Uh, 76, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I met this dancer, um, this uh, very nice person in, in Malta when we did, because with T, uh, before we kind of went our different ways, we had just finished five gigs, which is like a big tour for a little island in as Malta, five gigs, and they were all sold out. And these were 1,200, 1,500 venues, which was like massive for those days, you know. And uh, the fans went nuts, you know. It was like uh, when we arrived, the airport was just full of fans, the whole balconies and and uh, the band, even myself, we didn't know what hit us, you know. and. And people were kind of uh, frustrated because they couldn't get tickets, some of them. It was all sold out real fast. And so anyway, I uh, <clears throat> we, were, we all went back to Switzerland and the band went kind of separate ways. So I just went to London with Alice, you know, this dancer I had met in Malta and started, I wanted to turn over, turn the page and kind of uh, calm down a little and uh, yeah, start something new. And then I actually, after a while, got this band Easy Money going. And uh, Easy Money um, did a lot of work. We did uh, the pub crawl, you know, playing pubs here, there and everywhere in London. And uh, we recorded uh, a lot of demos uh, for this uh, publishing company. And uh, one song came out on the Metal for Mothers Volume 2 album. And this was around the time of the new wave of British heavy metal, you know. So I was there uh, <laughs> with this band. And at the same time, I auditioned with Rainbow and I auditioned with Crocus, you know, because I, I was really worried about the future and like time is passing, you know, when you're younger, a year is like five years today. <laughs> or is it the other way around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's the other way. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got kind of wanted to get my ass moving, you know, yeah. uh, and um, yeah, in the end, I, uh, nothing happened. I mean, the result from the audition with Rainbow was I had a great time, you know, and uh, and I, I was moving on, so I joined Crocus, you know. I mean, with Rainbow. I, I was picked up at Geneva Airport by a Cozy Powell. Wow. <laughs> he had this racing driver license. <laughs> and, and him and Colin, the Rainbow's tour manager, actually, he's also he was also a tour manager with Deep Purple. Big, huge guy. Um, uh, the three of us got into this Mercedes and... Um, and Cozy asked me, he said, do you mind if I uh, give it stick? You know, I said, <laughs> I said, well, you're a racing driver, so I trust you. So I just uh, uh, belted myself up in the middle and held both, both sides, you know. And we went through those country roads in France, you know, heading towards this, uh, this castle. We came to this castle, you know, typical uh, Richie Blackmore, you know. <clears throat> um, composing a new album or and auditioning new singers in this this castle and it was great. So Roger Glover, yeah, come walking down the stra stairs, you know, smiling, friendly guy, and 
I met the other guys, Don Airy, whose wife was pregnant, and it's like the whole crew, you know, and we had some tea and, uh, and discussed things. And it was really nice, you know, being sharing this great company uh, surrounded by big stars, you know. <laughs> Uh, and I, f I felt slightly intimidated, actually, you know, but uh, what came out of it after the audition, you know, is uh, that uh, it, it just, I guess I didn't fit in uh, vocally, you know, maybe not bluesy enough, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but but I was happy that, that I did that trip and uh, that new experience and it kind of uh, fired me up for for more. So, um, so then I decided to take the invitation and fly to Switzerland, uh, where I had spent seven years with T, to check out um, if something, if there's any magic happening, if I jam a whole weekend with with Crocus, see what happens. And I had known the guys because they supported T on the last tour in Switzerland. And uh, I especially fell in love with the with the way the guitar player, the lead guitar player, Tommy Kiefer, God rest his soul. Um, he he played magically, and I, I'm a big Jimi Hendrix fan, always was, and and he had that touch, you know, and you can hear it in in the album, Metal Rendezvous when he plays Fire, you know. So. Anyway, that that was uh, that. I got to know, know the band beforehand. So then I returned. It was like, hey, nice to see you again. And there was this uh, chemistry happening. So as we jammed over the weekend, just going over old stuff, you know, from smoke on the water to, to whatever. And uh, we got on, you know, we got on. And uh, I kind of felt like I'm back at home. <laughs> In Switzerland, you know, eating schnitzel pommes frites and, and, and ordering a stange, which is like a beer, you know, a pint. <laughs> no, a, a stange is less than a pint. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I felt at home and I decided, well, I'm going to do the move. So I, I came back to London and found a way to tell my buddies that uh, I was going to return to Switzerland and join this a band called Crocus, you know. And so it was. It's always hard, you know, when you've uh, played with with musicians for a for a few months or a couple of years, and then uh, you say, "I'm leaving you guys," and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> look for another singer. And uh, yeah, but I thought maybe they'll find a better one, <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> so <laughs> But I just wanted to move, you know, I wanted to to move on, move my ass <laughs> because time runs. Now, let's fast forward to, I mean, fat, go go back to 1976. Did you did you guys actually tour with Crocus? Is that true with T? Did you, was Crocus an opener for, for one of the T tours? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Crocus and, opened for, for T when we were touring with Tax Exile, the album Tax Exiles. And Crocus had Chris Von Rohr, the, the founder member, singing lead vocals, you know. And did you, did you see yourself in that band eventually? Like, did you, did you ever think maybe I could play with these guys someday? No, I didn't even think about that. You know, I, just, uh, I, I, had, I was dealing with the situation, that, that present situation with T., uh, coming to an end because the record company didn't review renew our contract, you know. So I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do next, you know. So I went to London next, you know, back to base, kind of. That's where I started off when I left Malta. So I went back to London to see if I could maybe find another opportunity, you know. And uh, then, then. Easy Money came together and uh, we released that song, Telephone Man, on uh, Metal for Mothers, Volume 2. And actually, I play that live now with my own band, Storace Band, uh, because, um, you know, my new album, Live and Let Live, 
has 10 songs and uh, it doesn't fill a concert so i have <laughs> i i take I take uh, songs from other bands, and one of them's Easy Money, one of them's Blue, and and of course Crocus songs, and it fills it up nicely. And um, yeah, we're having fun. We have a lot of fun uh, this year, and we're looking forward to more next year. And um, I'm, I'm I'm happy to say. My album got great reviews, and I've got a great band. We had great gigs, and you know, so this whole year, 2022, has been actually very productive and um, successful. Not not in a huge way, but you know, it's a first step. You know, and and next year we're gonna continue and make it grow. Now let's go back to Metal Rendezvous, your first album with Crocus. Did you write yeah. lyrics for this album or, or were uh, the lyrics kind of already done when you joined the band? Well, the, the lyrics were done, you know, and Metal Rendezvous was the reason why I joined Crocus uh, and also uh, Tommy Kiefer, the, the lead guitarist, because he was like amazing, you know. But no, the band, the band had improved since the first three albums they did. I thought they made a big jump forwards and they had uh, good melodic hard rock. And that's what I was looking for. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, with the uh, with the uh, metal rendezvous, talk to me about, you know, Tommy Kiefer's playing alleged the late great Tommy Kiefer. You know, he has a lot of great solos on this album. Can you talk to me about, how, how you know, about Tommy on this album? Well, Tommy was a jovial, nice guy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I loved him. We used to joke a lot. And uh, he visited me in London because I, I carried on living in London after I joined Crocus for a few years onwards, you know, till about 1980. 88 I was still living in in London you know but spending a lot of time in Switzerland and um, well Tommy he was like uh, deep you know when he played guitar he was was like in there with heart and soul you know like really 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 lost in his playing you know and uh it, it was amazing as a as an old Jimi Hendrix fan and you know Blackmore and and all the others from from the classic rock era. I I really loved the way he played and and my favorite song or I don't know if you can call it a song. It's a it's a masterpiece. <laughs> is, is fire? Yeah. You know, if you listen to his guitar solo on fire is just incredible wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah, amazing amazing now during that time is it true that you were approached by a production company to maybe audition for acdc yeah yeah but that was all that was all uh, never got more than that no, no, I, I, uh, I was happy in Crocus, and uh, I have made a big step forward in, in my, in my life and my career, and, and I felt like this big connection with Swiss Switzerland and Swiss people, Swiss musicians, and I felt like I, I was sitting in my, in, in my saddle and riding high on, on my horse. You know, it felt I was proud of Crocus, and, and. Um, in those days, of course, you have to look back at the time of the moment. It's like ACDC wasn't that huge yet. You know, they had a great album out, you know, Highway to Hell and and stuff. But uh, still, you know, they hadn't reached, you know, what uh, uh, we, we know them today as the biggest hard rock band uh, of all time, you know. But... Um, in those days, so it was for me like to 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 take a decision like that. It was just natural, just natural, you know. You now, know? with the next album, Hard Hardware, this was recorded in in London. Was it recorded in London because you were living in England? Uh, 
I was living in England, but we didn't record because I lived in England. We didn't live, we recorded in London because it was a place to be, you know, it inspired us. Uh, Chris Von Rohr is nuts about London and the rest of the band were and our management uh, from Free and Virgin Agency in those days, Har Harry Sprenger. Um, he had a booking agency and managed us and he used to travel to London often just, you know, for the inspiration. Uh, it, it wasn't the same swinging London like back in the 60s with Carnaby Street and Mary Quant, you know, <laughs> uh, but but it it still, it still was, was it's, and it's, it's always been, you know, in, in Europe, uh, an important place, not just London. I mean, as far up as Birmingham, you know, productions and, and everything, the, the, the big bands that came from there and from the north, you know, and as far as Scotland, you know, Nazareth, Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant, you know, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, you know. Yeah, so... Now, so was, was, was hardware a, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, no, was, was hardware uh, self-produced? Or did you guys uh, have a producer? No, no, we, we, we had a producer then. Um, what was his name now? Mark Durnley, I guess, could be. Yeah, or was it? Yeah, could be Mark, Mark Durnley. I think we produced that in in the roundhouse in the roundhouse yeah which was also and is still uh, an, a known place you know i think it's up in chalk farm and um yeah so we wanted to be inspired by by this energy by the by the spirit of what was going on in that country you know and we we felt slightly closer to the usa being in in the United Kingdom, you know, everyone's speaking English and, you know, we used to enjoy our hamburgers and fish and chips <laughs> and Indian food, <laughs> you know, uh, great, great. Yeah. Any favorite moments from hardware or songs that you really like from it? Um, well, of course, uh, a long stick goes boom. Yep. I, I get mixed up which songs are on which album. I I don't listen to a, to whole albums anymore, you know. Uh, um, um, but I guess that is the opening song which we've opened with and we'll carry on opening with. You know, we're, we're looking forward to a... Uh, a concert in uh, in May on the sixth May, and uh, I I can assure you we're going to open with Long Stick Goes Boom again. You know, it's, uh, the, oh. is, uh, <laughs> very nice, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and uh, I'm glad that it's not over with Crocus. You know, I mean the reason why. Why I did this is, is because Crocus, Crocus called it a day and said, well, it's over, Rover. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> not for me, it isn't. You know. <laughs> I'm just going to carry on by hook or by crook and because it's my passion singing. And, and I'm, I'm happy the way it turned out, you know, got good songs some evergreens on that on that one and um i enjoy playing most of the album live and i'm looking forward to more gigs and we got we got the last gig coming up it's a christmas uh, gig on the 23rd in a legendary place near bern which is the capital of switzerland it's called the mühle hunziken and we got some special guests. Um, you know, Tommy Henriksen, guitar player with uh, Alice Cooper, who is married to a Swiss uh, lady here and, and lives here close by. I met him through another Swiss band called China. And um, we've been friends since then. And last time we met was at a, at a festival in, uh, in Switzerland called... Uh, 
rock the ring and you know it was like uh it was like a natural thing and so he he also offered to help help out on the bass when our bass player emmy you know she's a hot play, bass player you know she she plays like uh, um, amazing stuff and and I, i'm a big uh roger glover fan and she can she can do that kind of stuff you know so she really fits in and so we've got this uh christmas gig coming up and we we said we'll we'll play the whole set as usual and add on a bonus you know with with these guests so tommy hendrickson was uh really pleased to come and join us and um we've got a rehearsal coming up on um, sunday for that and uh then uh, we also invited uh, an old Crocus member, a bass player called Tony Castell. And um, yeah, he actually filled in for Emmy. Um, <clears throat> and we all had already agreed to do it with him um, <clears throat> before, before Tommy Henriksen asked, you know, to, to help. So we did about five gigs with with Tony. So it'll be nice having him over before before the year is out, you know, to celebrate. And then there's a special guest, which is a very very special guest who we're not allowed to to say his name yet. Maybe next week, you know. And uh, I don't know when this interview is coming out, but <laughs> it's going to come out on next 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 Wednesday, next Tuesday, Wednesday. So. A week from today. A week from today. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe maybe Tuesday though. Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Well. <clears throat> well, and so the very very special guest is <laughs> 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 could be. Uh, I don't know. Could it be Johnny Depp? No. Nah. <laughs> I actually saw him in concert uh, last month with his uh, band with Jeff Beck. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. And awesome Tommy, Tommy Henriksen plays with the uh, Hollywood Vampires. Oh, okay. Together, together yeah. with him and and with uh, Coop, you know, oh. Alice. Yeah, yeah. So could it be Coop? Could it be John, <laughs> Johnny Depp? I don't know. Maybe it's someone local who, like, top of the... <laughs> uh, well... I guess I, I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> That's all right. That's fine. We'll That's keep okay. this as a surprise. Let's keep it as a surprise. Yeah. So let's go back to, uh, you know, one bass <laughs> at a time. Of course, Mark Kohler joined the band for this album. Tommy Kiefer wasn't there. How did he change the sound of the band? Ooh, well, what happened is before Mark Kohler joined, we... We took Mandy Meyer as a rhythm guitar player, and Fernando had the hard job of learning all the, all those solos, like in next to no time. And he, he did a great job out of it. And I remember we played the Hammersmith Odeon in London, and it was a crazy gig, crazy, really nice. Oh boy, then and. Um, Lemmy backstage, you know, he was a, a big fan and the way he, he came over, he was the first guy in the bar waiting for us, you know, and uh, he came over and it's great. He, he took Mandy, you know, and congratulated us and Mandy did a great job. He was only 19 then, you know, he was the youngest guy in the band and um, he threw this guitar all over the place and dragged it on stage and kicked it around. And <laughs> it was like uh, uh, magic what happened there. And then later on, um, well, Fernando said he, he thinks Mandy is great, but Mandy should be, be playing lead and not, and not rhythm. And, um, but he's he's gonna play lead. So he had this student called uh, guitar taking guitar lessons 
by the name of Mark Kohler, and uh, he'd like to try him out in the band. And so that's how it happened, you know, and Mark Kohler turned out to be the steadiest ever rhythm guitar player I've ever played with. He's like solid rock, you know, and that's great for a rock band like Crocus, you know, playing songs like Long Stick Goes Boom. <laughs> because that's real solid you know and big it makes the band sound big you know can you talk to me about why uh, tommy keeper left the band well tommy had a problem in spite of the sweet guy he was and uh, and the magical way he played guitar he had this problem he was uh, addicted to to some bad stuff, you know, and uh, it took over his life. And some t- towards the end, he was coming on stage with an untuned guitar and, and falling over his, his own feet, you know. So we played a festival in Scotland, Loch Lomond, with, with uh, was the first time we ever saw Saxon live. And we went, Wow, <laughs> Biff and the boys, you know, and um, yeah, and uh, at that sound check, it was like Tommy was like, and we we discussed it in the tour bus, and you know, said we're gonna hit the USA now, you know, and he's gonna become a a load, you know, heavy load on us, you know, it's like. We all love him, but uh, there was kind of no way out, you know. And uh, that's how we started looking for other solutions. Yeah. Now, with the Headhunter, the band made it really big, of course, was Screaming in the Night. Um, thoughts on that, tr- on that song? How did it change the band forever? <laughs> I think the whole album changed the band. <laughs> But Screaming in the Night was the epic ballad, uh, metal ballad. And I don't think Crocus ever did a more metal sounding album like Headhunter ever again uh, or ever before. (laughs) And the reason was, I think we had suddenly got we turned we got turned on by Judas Priest and wanted to have the same producer you know so tom allen entered the scene and you know we met in in arkansas where where our management uh, was uh, based and um, <laughs> on the fir- on the first day he fell off a horse and broke his, <laughs> broke his arm, you know so was, we were like oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Friday 13th? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but but uh, he was okay, you know, he was all, and and uh, his charisma and everything pulled him through and a few painkillers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he loved our demos. Um and we we didn't have the finished album yet, or you know, we're close to that, you know, but um, he loved what he heard. So he decided, yeah, that's let's do this boys you know he was very positive and inspired us a lot and it was it was really great working with him really now with the track screaming in the night what is that song about or who is it about uh well actually um um i i was actually singing about my own situation the way i felt at the time uh, and you know, I uh, yeah, I was thinking about uh, the ones I left behind. You know, um, a little bit of um, longing for home, which was London at the time, and uh, it was like the way I I I didn't want to write it like one on one, so that it sounds like. The reality but I, I used my fantasy and we had been watching a lot of these fantasy films and one of them was Conan the Barbarian next to Mad Max 
you know, uh, where Tina Turner is on that as well. And uh, so films like this, which kind of gave me the inspiration to write lyrics like those, which kind of explain my own situation. I could release my own feelings, uh, yet describing a story that sounded more like uh, the Vikings, uh, a Viking village being uh, destroyed. And uh, I go out there live with everybody to fight the enemy and come back and find my loved ones with a dagger through her heart. And, and, and then we took revenge, you know, sons of vengeance, you know, and went back and uh, <laughs> made minced meat out of them. You know, it was kind of, you know, I mean, uh, these are the kind of stories that uh, uh, I think metal is is talking about. And it's dramatic. It's, it's a love story as well. And um, adventure and... Yeah, I love the Vikings. <laughs> I've, I've watched every Viking series out. And wow. still, still today, you know. Have you yeah. seen the, the movie The Northman? It's about Vikings. Uh, well, Northman? The Northman, yeah. yeah, look it up. The Northman, yeah. Well, no, I've seen, I've seen them all. I don't remember titles, but okay. I've, I've seen them all. And uh, yeah, when I doubt, I, I go in again. <laughs> Say, oh, no, I've seen that. <laughs> Now, this album was recorded, Headhunter. It was recorded in Florida. How was it like recording here in the USA? Florida, Orlando. That was, it was great. And uh, it was, you know, we, we got away from the, from the European winter and, and <laughs> went to Florida, you know, so it was great. We had a pool there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and there was some uh, rock clubs well, one or two, which we visited often, and we just loved the, the the freedom in the USA compared to here. It was just just a different culture and the culture of rock and rock and roll, which is more existent there on on the streets. And uh, yeah, the whole look, the whole look of the USA. And in fact, it's it's incredible that I didn't end up living there in the end. You know. But uh, well, my European youth uh, roots always kind of called me back home, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, we. But but still, we we enjoyed we enjoyed doing it, and of course, the recording studio, BJ Studio in Orlando, and uh, it was also Tom Allen's wish uh, to use that studio and go there and where it's. A little warmer, <laughs> much warmer, and uh, we could concentrate on what we were doing far away from anyone we knew before, uh, kind of isolated and, and and yet having the greatest time of our lives. And it was like recording Headhunter for me was like an experience which reminded me of the same approach we we had with uh, T when we recorded our three albums with uh, Dieter Dirks, the producer of the Scorpions from the early albums, you know, and and there, you know, the 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 approach we had was the studio is old school, same as BJ's or or the one in Cologne. Big studios, separate separate compartments, with glass, drummer in the middle. We're all connected. Control room. There's there's Tom and uh, and we play the songs together at the same time. You know, <laughs> um, and and we're um, focus on the drums in the beginning. But while you're doing that, maybe someone else played something real good, and if the sound was all right, you kept it, you know. And so that saved a lot of time and it, and it also uh, gave a homogenic sound, a natural sounding live sound, live feel to the album. And even with my vocals, you know, I, I so what I was doing was doing, you call them pilot tracks. And we used five of my pilot tracks 
to uh, on the album. Yeah. And they happen to have the right sound, right equalization, right microphone, right approach. Uh, of course, I tried to better them, you know, said, OK, yeah, let's give it another shot, you know. But but I couldn't get the the same feel, you know. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Now, is Headhunter your favorite Crocus album? Do you think it's Crocus's best album? One of the best. I think One Vice at a Time is also a hell of a great album. Yeah. You know, uh, for me, it's a big mixture of songs. You know, it's like from Metal Rendezvous, Hard, of all of them, I guess. Even, even the Blitz and, and uh, school, uh, one, Change of Address, you know. And and even as far as today, I don't think I I like only one album perfectly from beginning to end. You know, um, I think it's good to be a little self-critical. Uh, but one vice at a time was also you know uh, a good one. Um, then, of course, after Headhunter. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we ran into some uh, <laughs> team troubles and, you know, the band members, we had another change and each time you change a band member, it's like, you know, it gives a certain uh, different feel w within the band and, and the worst thing is it, it changes the band sound a little bit, you know, yeah. Let's go back to Headhunter. How was it like touring for this album? You guys, you know, I, I of course I wasn't around back then, but you guys came to the U.S. Did you guys, did you guys have a big headlining tour when you toured for Headhunter? Uh, we we actually started off really well in L.A. We played this this show, uh, which really showed uh, Crocus in a in a raw form somewhere in LA I can't remember the what it was called but uh, there's a video of it the whole whole performance I I still like that one till this day and we had the Port Callis, you know the this production we did in Birmingham we had we had that out there and it was a a thing for television you know there were other bands on there and uh, and then we did the biggest tour of our lives. And this was with Def Leppard. Wow. And it was, uh, we did a, a couple of good months there playing huge arenas and sold out stadiums. And it was like a dream come true. Although we weren't headlining, you know, but we wow. had a, the hell of a time. We had... Uh, the time of our lives on that tour and we were special guests with with Def Leppard and they had Pyromania out and was doing really really well number two in the billboard charts and Michael Jackson was at number one wow. so it shows uh, which kind of era this this was a great era you know it's like it's for me it's a like a never come back era you know the, the, the whole vibe in the USA then it's like every car park you know every, outside all these burger joints so or whatever uh, people were partying 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 it was summer you know oh my god it's like never experienced that kind of stuff uh, to that magnitude again you know and selling t-shirts like hell merchandising and and our album Headhunter up there, number 24 in the Billboard charts. And was like, whoa, now we're talking. <laughs> 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 yeah, but then uh, but then we we uh, ran into some intrigue, you know. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we we experienced some trouble and the dark side of the moon, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> now talk to me more about more about the era of the 80s, you know, especially because, you know, you guys finally made it big in 83, 84. 
was it was it all just drugs, sex, and rock and roll for you know rock stars like you guys? How, what was what was it like you know back then? Oh, that was the the epitome. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it never got as bad as that, but it, it was fun. You know, we we lived to to. Uh, to to work the next day and that that was the most important thing is to know your limits you know and we were younger of course full of energy and you know we'd, we'd fall over and stand up again you know no problem so it was fun while we lasted uh, while, while, while it lasted <laughs> and we lasted <laughs> um but uh yeah it, it was all it was really uh, that was uh, the the epitome of uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know the way people imagine it. You know, and later on it became other things. You know, and you try and get away and uh, change a little bit to stay more healthy. You're getting older, and uh, you want to carry on. So the way to do that is to to keep fit and. <laughs> you know, stay away from the destructive stuff. And, you know, here we are today. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could go back to that tour, is there like a, a big show or a big, I don't know, moment, like a big show? Is it like the big, your favorite show? We talked about the show here in LA, but is there another yeah. show that maybe you could look at and think, wow, that was like the biggest show of that tour? The biggest show was yeah. uh, the Texas Jam. Wow. 1986 I think we were on the change of address tour I think wow. an album which really did not uh, uh, have the gr big reaction of Headhunter or the Blitz but but we were still Crocus and we were still known for you know Screaming in the Night and Midnight Maniac and and long stick goes boom so we always had good songs and we always could you know give a headliner a hard time you know we were proud of that <laughs> real cocky you know young and cocky <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, so yeah the texas jam there was eighty thousand sweltering people wow. in the heat of a summer sun you know in Texas, Dallas, that was amazing. I wonder if anybody's got a film of that, you know. And we, we wanted to film that, but uh, we got turned down. We weren't allowed to do it by uh, the manager of, of, of Van Halen. And, you know, so it was like a, 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 sour, a sour thing. Yeah. But, but, you know, um, we enjoyed that concert. And it was we played for an hour and it it went by so fast just bang like this you know and they had the the fire fire people were there with with hoses <laughs> sh and showering the people you know because they otherwise and and giving out suntan lotion for free you know big bottles of that and uh, the topless girls up in the <laughs> oh my god how could you concentrate? <laughs> <laughs> Especially those Texas girls, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, yeah. let's talk about the Blitz. Um, Mark Kohler, you know, switched to bass. Um, Chris Von Rohr left the band. What happened there? Yeah. Well, it was politics, actually. Politics. Uh, Chris... Uh, wanted to stick to the way we were doing things and uh, the record company and management tried to uh, they wanted to wanted us to go in a more commercial less heavy uh, direction and uh, you know the they told me to leave the grit out of out of my voice, you know, the yeah, you know, and sing smoother 
and they basically wanted us to go for the girls because because the girls were buying double as much albums and uh, cassettes in those days as the boys, you know, and record companies think in this way, you know, they have a, an agenda, they have, uh, and they just, you know, push their pedal to the metal, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and Chris was came up against this, you know, and, uh, and he lost the game. So he ended up uh, back home here in Switzerland um, in a really bad state of mind, you know, and I, I understand. And uh, so Fernando and I had to carry the torch and um, we did our best. And we went to Arkansas and worked in this little studio um, owned by Bob Ketchum. He was this engineer, like kind of amateur, but still great to work with for us. You know, we could out, get our things done. And we wrote the songs for the Blitz album, took a new drummer, you know, and uh, a new bass player to replace Chris. And, and, uh, and then off we went. We did a pre-production in, in, in LA and got the whole, whole thing working. And off we went again, you know, and, and we enjoyed it, and that that was it. You know, we we went into a new era. And, uh, but then the question comes, of course, later on, journalists, reviews, and everything, looking back and in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I mean? We should have, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, if pigs could fly, I said. <laughs> <you know. laughs> So, so that was it. We went through the blitz and then did uh, change of address, which was even softer than than the blitz. And in the meantime, we saw the rise, slow rise of of grunge, and we can blame it a little bit on them, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But but basically, uh, Chris was not fully off course, off the course driving course but he said uh, we should we should stick to what we know best you know which was like the heavy uh, more brutal kind of rock you know and um, but that but that's it you know you can't you can't change the past you know and uh, when we reunited uh, with Chris we did the heart attack and we we tried to get back to what we did before, but but we had missed the train, you know. And I, basically, that was it, you know. So after that, I mean, by that point, I was like really burnt out with uh, not much time off, and we used to take maybe a month off and fly home or whatever, and um, it wasn't enough, you know, because. Then it wasn't just physical, but it was also uh, the mental, uh, spiritual thing where you've done this, you know, <laughs> been there, done that, you know, want to move on kind of thing. And so I moved on. I said, <laughs> it's over, over. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, quitting after the Heart Attack album, you know, and I flew back to Malta to rest my bones. <laughs> now talk to me about Crooks's first live album, Alive and Screaming. Um, how was it like recording this album? What tour was it recorded on? Tell me about it. Alive and Screaming was actually recorded on the, was it the Blitz tour or Change of Address? But, it was one of the last two albums before we uh, did Heart Attack, you know. Um, no, it, it was actually recorded on the Change of Address tour. And uh, we have recordings there from Canada, which was a place we love to tour in Canada every year. 
you know, we just uh, get out of the USA and go all the way from one end to the other and start again. And it was great. And um, yeah, we, we stopped. I think we did some overdubs in Toronto, you know, um, to adjust the sound a little bit and as usual. And um, it was a crazy album. It was a, a wild. It's <laughs> awesome, man. Wild, wilder than the last two albums we we produced, you know, which is which was the whole point actually. We wanted to show because, excuse me, Crocus had always been a band and still is that um, brings kind of more you know more punch when we're out there live not because of the volume also the attitude the way the way we present play the songs and everything and um so that 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 is what you hear on uh, alive and screaming you know now with the heart attack uh this was the last album uh, for crocus for a long time was the band already breaking up when you were making this album well, we came close to it, but then we decided to have one one more go. And I had written a lot of ideas down um, before that happened. And then we came back to Switzerland, actually, and, and kind of back to the roots, back to base. And it did Crocus well, you know, from that point of view. But it it didn't uh, do enough to to heal the wounds, you know. It it didn't get us back there, and uh, the the relationship uh, between the musicians also wasn't that hot as it was in the in the headhunter days, you know. And and in between headhunter and uh, heart attack we had new guys on board who kind of new blood kind of refresh the, the the scene a little bit uh, the internal uh, situation and feeling within the band so you know and the ball was rolling you know uh, and but uh, heart attack kind of you know when we saw we changed record company went to MCA and uh, and we saw we kind of we didn't get the backing we, we were expecting which we actually needed we needed a hell of a lot more than so it was disheartening you know and um, yeah then I kind of threw in the towel <laughs> I said I need a break you know I need a long break now just Go see what I'm going to do next. <laughs> now, do you think the internal struggles in Crocus got worse when the band got more successful, you know, with touring, making money? Do you think it got worse with that? Yeah, I, I, I think so. It's, it's kind of uh, the internal quarrels, differences started to grow. And, and I think the... You know, the evil white powder didn't help at all. And this was around. Um, <clears throat> and for me, it was like taboo because of my vocal cords. Okay, I, I tried it one Christmas and one New Year and one concert with, with Joe, uh, Joe Walsh, I remember. That was the only time I tried it live on stage to see what happens, you know. And I remember... I didn't feel the blues anymore. You know, I sing, I sing heavy metal, hard rock with a bluesy feeling, you know, but I just, I felt more like a machine, just, just functioning, but not feeling, you know, and, and for me that there was a no, 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 this is not good. You know, I can't be a machine. I don't want to be a machine. I want to feel, I want to sing and, and, let the passion out, you know, and I couldn't even touch, touch that kind of during that gig, 
you know, and I loved your watch. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. <laughs> right. Amazing. Yeah. Legend, legend. Uh, so, so that was it. I said, no more, no, sir. No more. <laughs> <laughs> and I stuck to my, my uh, little joints and, and my cognac at the end of the day to put, you know, have a nice uh, landing and go to sleep. And I was always the, the last one up on the bus, on the tour bus, because that's when I used to pull the curtains back, switch all, off all the lights, put on Pink Floyd, <laughs> you know, roll a spliff and, and, and take out a, a cognac and everyone's sleeping in, in the back. And, and that's why I was always the last one to get <laughs> out of a bus, you know. Yeah. <laughs> get out on the parking lot, you know, with a generator running to, to, to give some air. Boy, those days, holy. <laughs> now, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so the band, uh, you know, got together in the mid-90s. How did you, why did you guys get back together? after that long break well you know how it is you know it's like a virus it's in <laughs> your blood whether you want it you're trying to stamp it out or not i never did i i always did other things so i did a lot of uh, stuff in between uh heart attack and well, we rejoined and did uh, to rock or not to be you know which was a title which came from our uh, American tour manager, L.D. Glover. Little Dave, we called him. He was as big as a house. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he, he used to say sometimes, to rock or not to be, guys. It means, yeah, that's, that's our word. You know, it's, a, it's what we are. And we used that as a title. And, and we, we had our first reunion without Chris, because by that time he was all, already uh, producing a band called Gotthard in Switzerland. You know, they're big in Switzerland. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, I, I've lost the thing now, yeah. We're talking about uh, getting back together in the mid '90s with Crocus. Oh, yeah, the the reunion. Yeah, first came this to rock or not to be reunion without Chris. Yeah, and we, and, we, uh, and then uh, we broke up again because our album went gold in Switzerland, but it didn't do any anything in Germany you know, where we wanted to tour next. So. A couple of us, like Mark Kohler, Freddie Steady, and myself, we had kids now, you know, and babies at home. So we couldn't just pack the suitcase and, and go. We had families, you know, responsibilities. And, and uh, there wasn't enough coming in to support us. So it was a, it was a very hard uh, situation, actually. So after that, we split up again, and later on, I did my thing. Everyone did his things, and uh, then I called Fernando again um, uh, to do the album uh, "Rock the Block." You know, said, "Let's get back together." I, I, I see the scene is is happening again in the USA, in Germany, Scandinavia, especially. You know. And let's get back together. Let's give you, yeah. So we got back together and we did Rock the Block and then went on tour and did uh, recorded the live album Fire and Gasoline. And, and for these two uh, tours, uh, I, I have to get back to my album now, Storachi. There's yeah. two, uh, two guys. The, the drummer and the, and the rhythm guitarist on on my album Storace are actually from that time. That's when we first played together, you know, because they they had a cover band, an ACDC cover band called DC World, and they invited me to sing uh, a ballad of Bon Scott on an album they wanted to record, a cover album. 
and they had this other guy singing Brian Johnson. And I did ride on. And after that, they said, well, can't you do more so we can do 50-50 Brian and, and Bond? Uh, yeah, so I, I got into that. We did DC World and uh, it came out nice, actually. And um, we, we, we did it as a tribute to Bon Scott, really. I think it was his 20th anniversary of, of his death or something like that. And um, yeah, so Fernando started, you know, he kind of, these guys were good, you know. And uh, so we joined forces with them and uh, changed a couple of, of musicians that did sort of DC World meets Crocus and and uh, came out with Rock the Block. And we did that whole tour. And uh, then we wanted to tour the USA and Fernando had a problem with his hand. He had to have an operation and, and stuff. And he said, uh, I don't want to hold you guys back. I'm stepping out. And, and luckily, Mandy Meyer, in the meantime, had joined Gotthard, and he had already left Gotthard, so he was free. And I called him up, saying, hey, <laughs> Mandy, yeah. Yeah. you toured with Crocus in 1982. Yeah, I remember Hammersmith Odeon, and uh, and uh, that's, that's, you want to get back on? And, uh, you know, yeah, sure, I, I'm not doing anything, and we, we, you know, flew to the USA. It was like an incognito tour we did. And uh, the goal was just to gel the band members together. So we did 22 gigs in 30 days. Wow. That's crazy, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Mostly in the Northeast, you know. So it, it, it was crazy. It was really crazy. But we enjoyed it. And um and after that, we were full of inspiration, you know. And then we recorded the album Hellraiser and toured again all over Europe. We, we never did such a big tour in Europe with Crocus ever, you know, until then. And after a couple of years on tour, uh, Swiss television asked us, asked the original three Crocus members, you know, Chris Von Rohr, Fernando, and myself, if we could do a medley on Swiss TV to celebrate Swiss artists. And Freddie Steady joined us on drums. And, and we, did, we did a medley of Tokyo Nights and Heat Strokes and... Uh, what was the other one? I can't remember the other one. But anyway, it was like immediately, bang, you know, and I got phone calls. and People were saying, if you don't see it now, you know. So then it happened, you know, the reunion. That was your question, 2000, 2008 or nine. Yeah. So we got together again and, and started rehearsing a new a new uh, gig and and played in the in the Stadt der Swiss in Bern for about twelve thousand people after such a long absence. So then it was clear to me, you know. So I I had to tell my Hellraisers, I say, guys, I guess you see it. Yes, we do. Mark, go ahead. You know, it's. Uh, you're on the crossroads, go that way, and good luck, you know. So it was really, and we're still friends today. In fact, we're working together again, and uh, yeah, it's it was great. I'm, I'm glad we did it, and actually Crocus has been longer together now since the reunion than we were to get together before, you know, in the 80s. Because that lasted, I mean, my time, I, my debut album then was Metal Rendezvous, 19, sang that in 1979. 
And I left in 1988, you know, and we got together in 2009. And what date are we in now? Looking at 2023. 14 years, yeah. Yeah, and I'm turning 25, man. <laughs> Now let's let's fast forward to to to, to now uh, 2020. You guys were going to be do, you're supposed to be doing a U.S. tour, the Adios Amigos tour. Uh, you guys are going to be playing here at the Whiskey Go in L.A. I was looking forward to seeing that. Is there any hope that we're going to see that U.S. tour ever happen? Now now that Crocus, Crocus is yeah. kind of active again. If it, if it was up to us, we'd be there like in a shot. But look what happened in the meantime, you know, <laughs> with COVID. I mean, COVID was a huge slap in the face. I mean, we, we were already, uh, 2019 in Europe, we were over. We said we played our last gig in the Hallenstadion, which is like the holy grail of, a holy ground of, of rock for Switzerland, you know, for the German speaking part anyway. And um, yeah, then <clears throat> they, you know, COVID lockdown, we stayed at home, you know, <clears throat> and uh, that's why I, that's when I decided I'm going to start working on songs for for my solo album, you know, because I don't like sitting on my ass doing nothing. And, <laughs> yeah. So in the meantime, time passed, you know, uh, people's tickets or, or whatever. Uh, I don't even know what happened to, to their tickets, you know. Oh, we, we got our money back. I got my money back. You got your money yeah, back. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. At <laughs> least. You know. Yeah, yeah. But but we, you know, we'd we'd be there in the meantime, the whole economy stuff. And and now with Ukraine, you know, Ukraine is a is a real big punch in the face to to show business. You know how many businesses already with lockdown, lots of businesses in, in every every kind. Uh, you know, went bankrupt and had to close. And it's the same with bus companies, production companies and stuff. And the ones left, they feel kind of free. They can ask for more, you know, whereas the price of petrol, you know, benzene, hey, gas, gasoline is uh, up there. And that's only one thing. You, you count everything together. It's like, you know, do, do we want to pay to tour? <laughs> Nobody wants to do that, you know, and we're not Led, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with the, you know, with, with the Crocus, you, we start, when we started the interview, you, you mentioned that it's not done. So what's, what's going on with Crocus right now? Well, as I said, we, we were, we, we suddenly decided, well, are we done? We're still alive. And after the break we had from 2019, which was the last gig in Europe, and the, the whole lockdown thing and, and uh, adios amigos, uh, kind of, you know, we were asked to do uh, 2,000 years of solitaire. And this is like the hometown of the band. Uh, it's uh, 2,000 years ago. It's like a hell of a long time ago. <laughs> it's like the Romans were, were living in solitary, you know. And uh, so it was great. We, we accepted to do that. And, and then we, we were thinking like, well, let's, let's also do a reunion. Let's do one more. <laughs> yeah. Let's do one more. And, and, and we got, you know, decided we're going to do this. And uh, it's actually, um, I feel great about that, you know. I mean, even though I've got my own band and everything, uh, but it's, it's for me, it's like, beam me up, Scotty. I want to get back to the mothership, <laughs> you know, spend some time with the boys again. And, and uh, I even enjoy the rehearsals, you know. I drive to Solitern. I'm back. Um, it's only an hour away from here, and uh, spend some time uh, with the boys. Because hey, you know, I joined in '79. That's a hell of a hell of a long time. Was that 40 years ago? 43 years ago, yeah. Holy moly! <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So so that that's it. You know, it's like a, a human thing, and it's a musical thing, and it's a spiritual thing because uh, you know it's in in your blood. You know, it's in my blood, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're looking forward to it. Now, what are your thoughts on Crocus's legacy as a band? Well, Crocus's legacy, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, the one and only uh, Swiss hard rock band that made it that far internationally with lots of lots of adventure uh, behind us. Uh, we pioneered, uh, you know, in, 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 in that sense. And for me, for me of, of course, personally, I'm, I'm coming from a, a, a tiny little island in the Mediterranean. And, and I came here over London and, and uh, teamed up with these boys. And so for me, it's, it's an even bigger step. You know, I first had to come to Europe, to the mainland. And, and um, so it's it's a it's amazing. Um, we're gonna we're gonna leave great songs behind. I think we have a great repertoire, and I think this is the strength of of Crocus. It's in the songs, um, and the and the live performances. You know, as I said, we're we made a name for ourselves when we started out in the USA in the early 80s, we became known as like the road warriors, merciless Vikings on tour. <laughs> That's a, like, because our, our goal was, if, if we could try to blow off the headliner, you know, like, you know, with all due respect, you know, um, then we, we, we would have a goal. You know, so if you if you're playing football, you need a goal. You know, you want to know you want to know where to aim the ball. <laughs> so we wanted to know. We had this this thing. Yeah, let's choose the right songs and and, and yeah, that's that's a punchy one. That's a good one. Da 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 da. da. Uh, so it's it's gonna be maybe the the one and only. I don't know. There's maybe. Th some some good new acts coming up, younger musicians that might uh, carry the torch and and keep on rocking. But um, yeah, I think it's in the albums we we recorded, you know. Now talk to me about your new solo album, Live and Let Live. What are your thoughts on it? You know, you of course want to promote it. What's what's your thought on on the on the new album? On, on the album I recorded? Yeah, the, your, your solo album, Live and Let Live. Yeah. Well, Ooh. <clears throat> well I'm, I'm really proud of it, I, I have to say. I have to be honest. And because it, it, was, it was a work which was done over the years, uh, as far back as the 22, 25 years ago, the, the, the song title already, uh, live and Let Live is coming from one of the songs that I wrote with my neighbor, ex-neighbor, uh, Charlie Priceel, great guitar player, a big Toto fan, you know. <laughs> so he's, he's not all he heavy metal and hard rock, but uh, a great guy to bounce ideas off and, and stuff, and, and he can come up with, with the right chords and stuff, you know. So Live and Let Live was... Uh, a part of a th of a three part uh, masterpiece, if you like, you know. I'd love to release the whole thing one day. Very cool. um, would be nice. It's it's about half an hour long, you know. It's <laughs> like it's like a whole side of a vinyl al vinyl album, you know. But it's 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 nice. It's a nice story in there. So what I did is because we cut it into three parts. I took the 
the one which is most uh, melodic, you know. <clears throat> and um, I did my first video together with Charlie because I didn't have a band together yet, you know. Um, then I then I wrote songs with uh, with a guy in in England, a guitar player in England from Newcastle. His name's Adrian Fisher, and uh, three of those songs are on the album too, like "Lady of the Night" and uh, the the ballad "Don't Wanna Go," which was which is uh, talking about that's pretty deep, very deep. And, uh, and and the rest of, of the songs I wrote together with this uh, couple of musicians, uh, Cyril Cominson and uh, Massimo Buonanno, the drummer and uh, uh, rhythm guitarist, uh, who like worked together as producers in this uh, studio called Power Play Studio in in Switzerland, close to Zurich, next to a lake, really nice, old school, Studer tape, tape machines, you know, and a big old Neve desk and huge con uh, room, you know, so you could separate the sound again. So I thought, okay, I can do it the way Dieter Dirks did it in Germany and the way Tom Allen did it in, in Florida and uh, get, you know, work on the songs together. I worked a lot with Cyril and, and Massimo and uh, we got the whole thing laced up and <laughs> got some good musicians and, and uh, started rehearsing and recording, you know, and all live. We said it's got to have a live feel on it, and um, of course, in the end, it, you mix with uh, Pro Tools, and we sent it to LA for for a mix, and 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 then it was mastered somewhere else in the USA, and and uh, so now I'm I'm really again, you know, the whole production. It's not heavy metal. It's not brutal sounding, um, but it it rocks, you know. And uh, I think especially the songs are what make me the most proud, you know, that um, I could come up with a collection of songs out of maybe a choice of 30, 35 uh, different demos, some very rough, some unfinished, some, you know. And so this is what I feel about my, my album, you know, and um, I'm, I'm always going to play songs from, from that album as long as I carry on doing my solo, uh, solo gigs. <laughs> yeah. Any advice for young singers out there? Well, uh, find yourself, find your voice. <laughs> um, of course, my, my way to, to find myself was by finding others. You know, it was like digging deep into other singers' techniques and stuff. And that takes focus, concentration, repetition, and dedication, and... and, and you have to be in there with your heart and soul until you, you you almost hear that singer breathing, you know, and and reach down into your own uh, box, you know, your own tool, and and see if you have it, you know, see if you have it. If you don't have it from this singer, you might have it from another, or you know. And then develop it and make it your own and, and try and add more of yourself to it, you know. And that, for me, that after the cover bands, it was when I joined T <clears throat> in Switzerland doing progressive music, where I really started to discover my own voice, you know. But I started off imitating uh, 
Robert Plant, Ian Gillen, Roger Daltrey, you know, Paul Rogers, and, you know, go for the best, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and hoping to, to come to a point where I'm doing my own thing. And, and I have to keep on developing in this way because as, as I age, uh, the quality of my voice changes, takes natural changes. And I have to still keep on finding out what works, what doesn't, you know, and and how can I, if it doesn't work because it's too high for me now, a song that I recorded like uh, 35 years ago might be too high for me in some places. We, tur we turn it down half, half a note. And, and uh, if it still doesn't work in some places, I have to bend the melody around and make a new melody there, you know, which is allowed, you know. So you have the live version, you know, you have the album versions, and you have the live versions with, when they work and people get off on it, then, it, then it's great. You know, first you have to get off on it yourself. And, uh, and then it's... Uh, it automatically uh, goes over, you know. And well, you, you keep your fingers crossed and and <clears throat> don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. <laughs> if you feel like you're getting hoarse, uh, you know, they must be doing something wrong. Don't burn the cord, the vocal cord, so you'll be off duty for a while. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. You know, I've, I've been been through that, been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah. I want to thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. It was great talking to a legend. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Stay heavy, everybody. Cheers.